started. Jonathan, I'll wait for a thumbs up. I think we are live. Thumbs up. All right. Thank you everyone for joining us today for our community conversations about our native bees and no mo may. Um, as always, we are recording today's presentation, We're going live on Facebook, and then um, all of these conversations are available on our website. You can go to www.pcecmt.org backslash community conversations and look at old ones, watch this one and share with your friends. Um, we are very excited to talk about No Mo May and to have a special guest today from uh, Livingston's Parks and Trails Board, Clay Bolt. Um, I'm gonna introduce him in a minute, but first I wanna do a quick introduction about PCEC and our work. Uh, my name is Michelle Ibaraga. I have the pleasure of serving as the Executive Director for Park County Environmental Council. We are your community conservation group. So we work with people here in Park County to safeguard the land, water, wildlife, and communities in Yellowstone's Northern Gateway. We do that through grassroots organizing and advocacy. Park County is the traditional homeland of the Apsiloka or the Crow tribe and their ancestors. And I apologize, I still think I need to work on my pronunciation, um, but I'm gonna keep working on it. Uh, for the Crow and other indigenous people across the region, like the Nor like Northern Yellowstone's Tukadeka, this area continues to be culturally and spiritually significant, as well as home. Park County today has a long tradition of human habitation, of people who've loved, cherished, and stewarded this incredible place. And we are committed to working together in, to honor this legacy and the, this place for future generations. Uh, we've been hosting these Zoom conversations, mm -hmm. focusing on growth and planning in our community and uh, in some of the most pressing conservation issues that we face. Um, and we do that so that we can all become more knowledgeable and effective advocates for the things that we care about. Um, as you all know, there's a lot happening in Southwest Montana around growth right now. Um, we've been seeing more and more folks moving to our neck of the woods and uh, growth is coming. And we really believe uh, that that trend has been happening and will continue to happen and that we're gonna get the best outcomes for our community if we can come together, talk about um, the future that we wanna see and the future that we wanna be. Um, B, speaking of bees, <laughs> today we're going a little bit off topic and we're, we're, we're focusing on work that's happening. And I'm sure that folks in Livingston at least have seen signs coming up around town for um, No Mo May. Uh, and we get to learn a little bit more about that today from Clay, who had the vision for this, bringing this to our community through the Parks and Trails Board, um, where he serves and where PCEC Sarah Stans also serves. So I'm excited to hear more about it. Um, and I'm gonna do a quick introduction for Clay and pass it over to him. Um, Clay is currently working for World Wildlife Funds, um, Northern Great Plains program where he works on communication strategy to fight insect and grasslands biodiversity loss. Um, Clay is also a natural history and conservation photographer specializing in the world's smaller creatures, which I imagine is uh, requires more knowledge, good use of photography <laughs> to get those little creatures. Um, and his current major focus is on North America's bumblebees. Um, I could not, I could say a whole lot more about Clay. He's got a really impressive and incredible resume and um, just never, I never am shocked when uh, we have such amazing people like Clay here in our community, not only living here with us, but stepping up and serving on roles and bringing these great ideas. So uh, thank you, Clay, for your service on the Parks and Trails Board, for being an active member of our community, and for being here today to share with us about um, how to protect native bees. Pass it over to you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be able to speak with you all today, and I'm just going to share my screen now. <clears throat> So give me a thumbs up if you guys can see my screen. All right, great. Well, it's a real privilege to be able to talk to you today about 
some of my favorite things in the world. And, you know, Livingston is a really special place in terms of, you know, the wildlife that we have here. That's no secret that, that Livingston is, uh, and Montana in general, is a haven for wildlife. But one thing that I think people often don't realize is that we're also, even though it's a very cold place, we have some really special uh, small creatures that live here as well. And so today, what I thought I would do is start out by giving you a little bit of background about bees in general, because uh, this is the time of year here in Montana when we're starting to see bees and butterflies flying around our community. I'll give you a little bit of background about bees in general, and then talk to you about some very practical things like Nomo May that we can do here in our community to, to make life better for bees. Um, so a little bit of background about myself. Um, I am a natural history and conservation photographer, and I specialize, as Michelle was saying, in the world's smaller creatures. So I do find myself from time to time working in places like Panama, photographing reptiles, places like California, photographing salamanders for organizations like National Geographic and many other organizations that focus on conservation. I occasionally even will, um, I jokingly say, slum it and photograph, um, photograph uh, mammals as well. But Typically, I'm focusing on insects in my work because insects are so incredibly important to our world. And they're also um, oftentimes overlooked because especially in a place like here where we have some of the greatest um, diversity of large mammals in the world, sometimes it's hard to focus in on the little things. But without these little creatures like damselflies, without beetles, without bees, um, it, life would be a lot more difficult for large animals and large species in the world, including, including ourselves. I also do a lot of work um, more and more these days around people's connection to insects because, you know, I'm really curious about the psychology between, behind why some people are more connected to nature than others. And so, for example, I've I'd spent some time with my friend Kevin Poirier, who's a Lakota artist down on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. And Kevin is a, um, a strong advocate for monarch butterfly conservation because of his connections to this amazing species. And over the last few years, and I'll get into this a little bit more, I've been very involved with conservation of, of, of different species of bees, in particular, I've been working with bumblebees. So I was really involved with the rusty patch bumblebee, which is a species, the listing for this species. Um, I'm getting feedback from somebody. If you could, you guys could all mute, that'd be great. Um, and so I did a lot of work around the, the conservation of the rusty patch bumblebee, which is a species that was once found throughout the Eastern United States, all the way over to the Dakotas and down into Nebraska. And then over the last 15 or so years has declined uh, nearly 90%. And when we talk about conservation of bees here in Livingston, this is a really important time for some of the species we have here in our town, including the Western bumblebee. So what we do here in our community can actually really help out some of these other species that are related to the rusty patch that are not doing super well. And occasionally I get to do really cool things like look for um, lost species. In 2019, I was able to rediscover the world's largest bee. Um, Wallace's giant bee, also known as Megacali Pluto, which um, was thought to be extinct until we were able to rediscover it. And this just is an example of how large this insect is compared to a honeybee um, for scale. So anyway, I really get to do a lot of interesting stuff and I, nothing brings me more joy than to try to help um, bring more awareness and attention and conserve the species that are found literally here in my backyard in Livingston. You know, I mentioned earlier that insects are super important. And one thing that people don't realize is that over 99% of all life on this planet is smaller than your little finger. So when you think of all the life on this earth, in fact, most of it, most of the things we often think of are the really big things. Because in fact, you and I are also some of the largest creatures on this planet. And so because of that, we oftentimes, it's easier for us is in general to, to relate to the other large species in our world. But when you think about the sheer number of insects in this world, and you imagine what would happen, for example, if those species were not here anymore, um, it, it kind of makes my head spin at least. Uh, entomologist E.O. Wilson estimates that at any given time, there's 10 quadrillion insects alive at the world at any time. 
And if you were to place all of the insects in the world on one side of a scale, and then all of the other animals, you know, thinking about even blue whales and, and gorillas and all these large things and bison, the insects would actually outweigh the other species because they're just so abundant. And um, one of the challenges I think we have in trying to protect insects is that because we see lots of them flying around, we think, well, there's plenty of them. But in fact, we need a lot of these insects in the world because of their role and the roles that they play. And it's often difficult to even get a sense of what we're seeing because so many things are so small. So you might see something flying by very quickly and you think, well, that's just a fly or a gnat. But when you look at it up close, um, you realize that we are surrounded by this beautiful, exotic look looking wildlife on a small scale. For example, this is a, a bee. We have several species like this around town, uh, commonly called a metallic green sweat bee. It's smaller than a grain of rice. So without looking at it up close, you know, you don't really see how beautiful these things are. So one of the things I try to do in my work is to help people see the details in these species so that maybe they take a second glance or pay more attention. And unfortunately, we've been getting a lot of pretty concerning news from the scientific community that the world's insect species are, numbers are plummeting, not just bees, not just monarch butterflies, which is sadly being proposed for listing under the Endangered Species Act as well, um, but also just in general, insect numbers are plummeting. Um, and over the next, you know, several years, we expect that potentially 40% of the world's invertebrates may go extinct, which is a really, really big deal. But the good news is there's a lot that we can do, even on a local level, to help these species um, to do better. I'm just going to skip that. I mean, I've pretty much touched on the fact that losing these insects will cause so many ripples throughout the world's ecosystems. So around 2013, I, um, like many of you, began to see these headlines on, in the newspapers, what's happening with the loss of bees, primarily looking at the loss of honeybees. Um, but what I didn't realize at the time as I began to look more into it is that honeybees are actually not native to North America. They were brought over in the 1600s, and we have a very close relationship to honeybees because in part, because we love honey, but also because of the way that we grow our crops. So many of our crops are grown in what's called a monoculture, which means, for example, let's take the almond groves in California. There's a million acres of almonds uh, being grown in, in California. Now, when those almond trees bloom, there's tons of food for the natives, for the bees. But once they stop blooming because of everything being grown in this monoculture that blooms at the same time, essentially these areas become food deserts for, for bees. And so we have to truck in honeybees because otherwise um, these plants couldn't be pollinated because there's no food for, for bees other times of the year. So as I began to look into this, I realized some really fascinating things about bees. And first of all, like I said, that honeybees are not native. They're actually doing pretty well. I'm not saying that there isn't die off or colony collapse disorder, but being concerned about the loss of honeybees is kind of like worrying about chickens or, or cows going extinct. There might be differences in populations from time to time, but this is a managed species that's found around the world. However, our native species are not doing so well. And when you go out and you start looking at flowers, like this is a really small aster about the size of a nickel, you start to see that, oh, there's a lot of different types of bees flying around the environment. But I think before I get into some of the details about what we can do, I thought it might be useful to, to talk to you about what a bee actually is, because I think there's, you know, there's a lot of confusion from time to time. So um, bees are in an order called Hymenoptera. And some of the closest relatives of bees, and some of this won't be a surprise, are ants. Ants are highly social species that um, actually bees and wasps evolved from ants. Ants were around much longer than, than bees. There's also a group called sawflies, which the, the larvae of sawflies look very much like caterpillars. And sawflies look a little bit like a cross between a wasp and a bee. They have some different body segments, but they're also closely related. And then wasps are a very close relation, related, they're very closely related to, to bees as well. And in fact, 
there's a group of wasps that scientists believe bees evolved from. So wasp, oftentimes, you know, definitely wasps sting and, um, you know, there are concerns about people getting stung by wasps. But wasps are actually super important because most wasps are carnivorous. And that means that they're eating lots of things that could become pests like caterpillars, aphids. Um, there are even wasps that are parasitic on other wasps grubs, a lot of these things that can really get out of control, wasps take care of those for us. And so while we may not love them, um, or many people may not love them, <clears throat> it's important to recognize that they are important for keeping the balance in the ecosystem. But somewhere along the way, many millions of years ago, um, there was a group of wasps that began to um, drink nectar and collect some pollen. And over time, those wasps evolved into some of the first bees. Now bees have been around um, for, like I said, many millions of years and around 150 million years ago, the first flowering plants um, arose. So bees were around slightly before that and they began to have this long relationship with, um, with these flowering plants. There are also a lot of lookalikes in the world. So I use this as an example, Bees of the World, which is a pretty famous book. But on the cover of this book, sadly, is not a bee, but in fact, a fly. Um, so I can only imagine um, what conversations were like after this book was published, um, and the authors found out that the designer had put a fly on the cover. Um, needless to say, there are a lot of things in our world that look a lot like bees, and a lot of flies actually use this strategy called Batesian mimicry, which basically means when a harmless species mimics or has evolved to look like a species that can sting. So for example, um, the, the insect on the top is a, a type of hoverfly, which is also a very good pollinator. I photographed this fly up at Livingston Peak um, last year and the bee on the bottom, which I photographed in town as well, I think over at Sacagawea on the shrubs is a red belted bumblebee. And you can see how similar they actually look. And by the way, um, for most who are interested, I mean, most bees, or at least male bees, can't sting. Only the females can sting. So right there off the bat, um, only half the bees can sting. There's also often a lot of concerns about, well, if we're bringing more bees into the community, does that mean I'll get stung more? The fact is that most bees are too small to sting. And honeybees, the ones that people tend to love the most, are the ones that sting the most people because they're highly social they live throughout a season and they have a big nest to defend. And so because of that, they're actually highly aggressive. Most bees, like even with bumblebees, I wouldn't recommend this if you were, if you were allergic, but you can actually like, you can pet the bee while it's on a flower and it's not gonna try to sting you. They're not, they're not aggressive in the same way that, that honeybees are. So right off the bat, I like to help people understand that these bees just need to do their job. They don't, they're not trying to get us. If you step on the nest of, a, of like a bumblebee nest, they might try to sting you, or maybe you get a little sweat bee stung in, you know, in your clothing and it might sting you because it's afraid, it's trying to defend itself, but they're not gonna come after you. And if you see a bumblebee around a flower, for example, and it flies around your head a few times, that can freak people out. But the truth is the reason it's doing that is because bumblebees are very good navigators. They navigate using two things and smell, maybe three things, probably smell, but also the direction of the light, and they also memorize elements in the landscape. So when they fly off of a flower and you're suddenly in the environment, they're basically mapping you out. They, they think you're a landmark because you're so large compared to them. Here's another example of a cool mimic. Um, this on top is an insect called a bee killer, which is a type of predatory fly that preys on bees. And so um, nature has all of these ways of figuring out um, strategies for predation, and also for, for surviving. Now worldwide, there are 20,000 species of bee. Most of those bees are solitary, which means they don't have these large hives to live in or these large colonies. Most bees are actually living in the ground in very tiny holes that look similar to an ant nest. So if you have a bare patch of ground in your yard, for example, or ground along your driveway or along the sidewalk, those are actually really great places for these small bees to live. And we have a lot of these little bees here in Livingston. Um, they're not much bigger than an ant, but if you look very closely at flowers like the dandelions that are flowering right now, you'll see some of these tiny bees. 
Now the world's bees come in lots of different colors and shapes and sizes. Um, this is a bee that I photographed in Indonesia that has scales on its body like a, um, like a butterfly's wing. It's called a neon blue cuckoo bee. Um, bees come in all of these different metallic shapes and forms. Um, the one on the left is from Panama. And you might think, oh, that's a stinger on the bottom of its abdomen, but actually that's its tongue folded beneath the body. It's a male, so it doesn't have a stinger. And on the right, it's a group of blue banded bees sleeping on a vegetation, uh, which bees will often do, especially the males, um, uh, at night in Indonesia. There are squash bees in the world. Many of the world's bees are actually specialists. So there are squash bees and blueberry bees. There are bees that specialize in cranberries. Um, a lot of our native bees are much better pollinators than actually than honey than honeybees because they evolved to be pollinators of these different crops. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are bees that have these weird adaptations. For example, this is a type of um, uh, bee that lives in the Atacama Desert down in Argentina, which is one of the driest places in the world. And so it's evolved this long snoot to collect floral oils from plants that grow in these very harsh environments. There are even bees that fly at night, believe it or not. Now here in North America, we have around 4,000 species of bee. We're, we're discovering new ones all the time. Many of them are called cryptic species because they look very similar to other species. Um, and in fact, a new one was just discovered in the Beartooth range um, by some Swiss entomologists, um, which looked very similar to another one of our high altitude bumblebees that I'll talk about in a second. So it's been named um, Bombus incognito because it looks virtually identical to the species that it was confused with for many, many years. Now here in Livingston, pretty soon you're gonna to start to see geraniums blooming. These little native geraniums are up in the prairie around Livingston Peak and other places. And some of the first bees you're gonna see are some of the little sweat bees that are very, very tiny, probably smaller than a grain of rice um, sometimes even half as large as a grain of rice. They're really, really tiny bees, but they're very important pollinators. And you can see on the back legs of this bee, um, her legs and her body are covered with special hairs called scopal hairs. If you were to look at those hairs under a microscope, they're actually branched like a feather, which is one of the things that allows bees to be such good pollinators. And in fact, bees carry a static charge with them, which allows the pollen to basically jump to their bodies, which is pretty awesome. There are metallic bees. There are bees like this mason bee that um, are fast flyers that you'll find um, all around the community. There are striped resin bees that look very much like a wasp. There are in late summer, if you go down to, for example, the farm to school garden, um, you'll see special bees on a lot of the sunflowers. So we have these late summer bees called longhorn bees that are pollen special, uh, they're sunflower specialists that only come out at the end of the season. And you can see how much pollen she has on her body. Um, there are early spring longhorn bees. So this is a male and the longhorn name comes by, the males have these long antennae that they use to, to detect the females in the environment. There are super, super tiny little kleptoparasitic bees. Um, this is not a composite, this is actual size next to a dime. There are all these different types of bees called leaf cutters, which I'll talk about in a bit, but um, leaf cutters have a lot of different cool adaptations for living in the environment. This is one of the, this is actually not from um, Montana. This is in Wisconsin. This is called a fuzzy legged leaf cutter bee. And this is one of the most fashionable bees I've ever photographed. This bee actually has these fringed front legs because it uses those hairs to actually, he, he's a kind of a jealous guy. And so when he's mating with a female, he doesn't want her to see any um, competing uh, male, so he'll actually cover up her eyes with those fringes um, so that she can't see a, a, a better opportunity uh, flying past. Now, the group that I want to talk about specifically in relationship to, to Montana and Livingston are bumblebees. Um, bumblebees, there's 250 species of bumblebee, known bumblebee in the world. This number has actually changed in terms of how many we have in the U.S. It's gone up over the last few months um, to closer to 45 species or new subspecies have been introduced. And Montana actually has the highest number of bumblebees in any state of any state in the country. Um, and, you know, I think the number is somewhere around 28, but it could actually be more like 30. Um, and as we discover new species through DNA analysis, there could be even more. 
Unfortunately, one out of every four species of bumblebee in North America is at risk of extinction. And a lot of that's for the same reasons that other species of bee are going extinct. And that is habitat loss, pesticide usage, and sometimes introduced disease as well. So in here in Livingston, like many parts of Montana, we have a lot of really awesome bumblebees. And bumblebees are some of our best pollinators uh, because they are what's called a generalist pollinator. It means that they visit lots of different kinds of flowers. Bumblebees have superpowers that other bees don't have. So they do really well in cold environments in places like Montana. And they're able to actually unhinge their wings from their flight muscles and shiver their bodies to warm their temperature, which means that they can fly early in the morning when most insects are still trying to warm up. Um, they also can do something called buzz pollination or sonication, where they can unhinge their wings from their flight muscles and vibrate their body at a the note of middle C, and it causes pollen to fall out of plants such as tomatoes and um, blueberries. And this is a, one of my, my favorite bees that we have here in Livingston, also photographed down at the hedgerow at Sacagawea called Bombus bifarius, which is one of the species or the two form bumblebee because they're multiple colors. And until last year, it was thought to be a single species, but now we've, uh, it's been split into three different species. But as I mentioned, they're some of our most valuable pollinators because they visit so many of our food crops and our gardens here in town. And they're um, really able to live here in Montana because they originally evolved in the Himalayas where the temperature fluctuates. Um, they need to have these special adaptations. They do really well in the mountains. Um, they live really at high altitudes in places like the Beartooths and we have specialized species living up there. So Montana as a natural fit really harkens back to that early lineage of bumblebees. They're also great because they're found in our cities. They're found along coastlines. Um, they're found in places like the gravelies where, you know, again, this is a place where the temperatures change very quickly. Um, they're found in working lands and ranch land. They do really well wherever you can put flowers and give them a place to nest. They're doing really well. Um, they love our meadows. Um, and here in Livingston, we have a really, really special bee that's called the Western bumblebee and or Bombus occidentalis. And this is a species that unfortunately is in really serious trouble. It's a close relative of the rusty patch bumblebee that I mentioned earlier that I helped to put on the endangered species list. And this is actually another species that's proposed for listing because its numbers are declining precipitously. And we are very fortunate to have it here because in many places of parts of its range, for example, parts of California, when people find a Western bumblebee, they're super excited because it's so rare. And in many places, they're not even seeing it anymore. So we have a real treasure here in our community. And so that's one of the reasons I was so passionate about starting the Nomo May initiative here is because when early spring queens, this is a queen Western bumblebee that I photographed in my backyard on South 8th Street last year. Um, and they really need these spring flowers because what happens is in the fall, new queens come out, they mate and they go into sort of a hibernation state called estivation or it's a state of torpor. It's not exactly like uh, how a bear, for example, hibernates, but they hibernate in such a way that, that it allows them to um, conserve energy. But when spring comes around, they have to build up their nest. They have to build up enough materials, protein, um, nectar to, to lay eggs and feed young. So when they come out in spring, the first thing they do is they look for flowers. And because we live in this place that used to be a grassland, um, there are less food sources than there used to be. So one of the most available food sources we have here in town happens to be dandelions. And yes, dandelions are not native, but they're a, an important food source. And quite frankly, they're not going anywhere anytime soon. So it's like a, if you can't beat them, join them kind of mentality. Now, uh, eventually what I would like to do is create a, a, a project here in town for us to monitor using our smartphones, to monitor the bees that we're seeing. But Western bumblebees are super easy to deter tell from other bumblebees because they have these bright white tails. Um, there is some variation, but they're the only species of bumblebee that we have here in town that's you know mostly black, a little bit of yellow in the abdomen, uh, uh, sorry, the thorax, but then at the end of the abdomen, there's a bright white or very pale hairs. And so that's one of the ways you can tell the Western bumblebee from other bumblebees. 
So closing up, I just wanted to give you guys some really simple things that we can do to help bumblebees. So as I mentioned, um, we have this new initiative here called Nomo May. And we're actually, as far as I know, the first city in Montana to adopt a Nomo May initiative, which is something to be super proud of. And I wanna thank um, Lisa Lowey and Shannon Holmes for their support from the city because they really helped make this possible and helped us push this through very quickly. And again, the idea is, okay, it's not celebrating dandelions, it's celebrating so much the opportunity that dandelions can provide and a way to turn a negative into a positive. Ideally, everybody in this community, if, if I were to have, you know, if I could make a wish, I would love for people to have beautiful wildflower gardens and plants and their, their instead of grass that has to be mowed and tended. I'm not anti-grass, but, um, you know, if, if we're looking to help pollinators, it's best to have native plants. But an easy thing we can do, which allows us to have another month without mowing, which I'm all for for my own personal self, is that we can just let our grass grow. And that provides food sources for lots of different, different bees. Um, and you've seen signs around town. We're trying out several different um, plot points here in town, including um, uh, Mars Park and um, along the Highway 89 South bike path and um, Myers Riverview Park, or sorry, um, Myers Landing and some other places just to see how it works. And we're also giving out some signs for people. And by the way, if the, there might be a few signs left. If you go over to the rec center, which is at the top of the um, Civic Center, they, they are passing out a few signs. And all we ask is that you fill out a little survey at the end of the month. And we will pick up the signs this year, but maybe in the future, we can have enough signs that people can keep them. But if you don't wanna do that, um, you can go to this web address at the bottom, which is also, if you go to Livingston, Livingston's um, website, you can also just go to this um, link and download a PDF and print it out and put it on your window at your house. But as I mentioned, so many different species use dandelions, um, not just bumblebees. They're really a great food source. The best thing you can do though, is plant wildflowers in your garden. Um, it doesn't have to be native species. These are cosmos, which are from Mexico. Um, but you can also plant native species and, and it's ideal, just like us, bees need a, um, a varied diet and they need food throughout the time that they're out and about. So plant a mix of flowers that bloom all the way from early spring until the fall. Things like goldenrods are great. I recommend um, sourcing from distributors that are um, uh, sustainably sourcing their seeds, that they're organic so that they're not treated with neonicotinoids, things like that. But really just giving these bees food is, is a really great step forward. Also, you know, having a variety of foliage in your garden will bring some really interesting insects. So for example, um, you may notice from time to time, um, I noticed here in my garden in service, in my service berry bush, for example, leaves with these weird sections cut out of them. Now you might think, well, that's a caterpillar. And sometimes maybe it is a caterpillar, but in many cases, it's actually a really interesting species of bee called a leaf cutter. Leaf cutters are nesting in the soil or they will nest in, in trees. Um, they're solitary and they have a very special adaptation for lining their nest um, to protect their young. So this is a leaf cutter building her nest in the soil. And this brings me to one really important point as I touched on, as I touched on earlier is having some patches of bare ground in your garden, whether it's along your driveway, along the edges of your garden or in the back corner of your garden, provides nesting habitat for bees. And again, because these bees are solitary, they're not out to get you, they're not out to sting you, they will totally leave you alone. You can, I mean, I spend a lot of time face to face with a bee and they're not, you know, I'm not getting stung because they don't have any interest. It's very dangerous for them to sting us because that means they could die. And then because they're solitary, they have no one else to take care of their young. So they really wanna avoid confrontation as much as possible. And then this is a female leafcutter bee taking a bit of leaf that she's cut back into her nest and she will line her nest with that to create a cradle for her young. And this is an example of kind of what that looks like. So um, you can have these uh, native bee nests, which I'll show you a photo of in a sec. And those are often filled with these variety of different uh, larvae from different types of leafcutter bees and mason bees as well. We also have carpenter bees. Now this species on the left is an Eastern species, which has been seen in Bozeman, but it probably came in on some lumber. 
But the one on the right is a ceratina, also known as a small carpenter bee. And these bees actually are, are, are they use um, mostly dead vegetation to nest in. So for example, at the end of the season, if you have raspberries, leave the stalks up over winter. Um, and the reason why is because many of these small bees actually nest down in these pithy stalks. Sunflowers are great for that. Raspberries are great for that. Um, a lot of these different sort of stalks that we have are really good for nesting bees. And so wait a little while if you can and leave them in the garden. Um, and you'll notice that you'll have more of these small bees around, which are great pollinators. And this is a close up. They're very shiny. They're tiny, small, small, about the size of a grain of rice. Um, the back of their their um, abdomen looks a little bit like a plastic water bottle. It's sort of ribbed like that. And for bumblebees, um, they are the more social of our native bees that we have here in Montana. Um, they need messy areas, like areas that are not mowed. They leave some, some um, uh, leaves in the backyard maybe, or some you know, bundles of sticks, things like that, if you can. And they like to nest in those, and they often nest in old rodent burrows. So, Mouse nests are a great place that <clears throat> bumblebees will actually often use for, to start their nest. And so very quickly, here's a, a bumblebee life cycle. We'll start over here on number three, actually. This is what happens in winter. Um, a new queen bee mates, and then she goes in the ground to, to rest, as I mentioned. And then in spring, like right now, I've seen my first bumblebees over the last few days. They come out of hibernation and she makes herself a little honey pot believe it or not, it's really adorable, out of wax, fills that with nectar, and she sits on her eggs, especially at a cold place like Montana, like a mother bird, until those workers grow big enough. So she's coming out once or twice a day, and most of her time is spent sitting on her eggs until her daughters are born. And when her daughters are born, she will stay in the nest and begin to raise more young while they will be the ones that will go out and forage. And that's why in the spring, you see these giant bumblebees flying around. And as the season goes on, Many times, depending on the species, the, 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 the bees are smaller and smaller because the workers are tending to be much tinier than the new queens. And so finally, at the end of the season, her daughters will overthrow her or she will die, and then they will go and mate, and it starts over again. So having these messy places is great for bees. And then finally, there's a few other things you can do. You can go over to places like Woods Rose and buy these native bee houses, but you could also um, just collect bundles of stalks like I was showing you. These are from, um, I think these are from my raspberries. And you'll get, you'll get species like um, uh, mason bees nesting in your garden, which are really great pollinators. You can also try, I just put a piece of my apple tree in the ground because I noticed that there were these little small mason bees nesting, um, super tiny nesting in my apple tree and I had to cut some branches off of it. Um, so I just buried it in the ground and drilled some additional holes in it. And this is an example of one of those bees in my apple tree, really super tiny bee. These holes are smaller than the size of a, like a bee bee. But when you look at them up close, you realize they're provisioning them with pollen and then they're capping them over with pollen from my garden. So anyway, there's just no, there's no end to the opportunities we have here in Livingston. And then finally, just a reminder that, you know, insecticides and pesticides are really bad. For, for bees um, goes without saying, but I think a lot of times people feel like, well, if I don't spray the bee directly, it's gonna be okay. Not always the case. Fungicides are also really bad for, for bees because they, they affect the, the larvae. So as much as you can, try to naturalize your garden if you want more bees, because you know the less inputs we put in in terms of chemicals, the better off the bees are gonna be. So anyway, thank you so much for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have about about bees now. Thank you, Clay. Um, I am totally blown away. It's such an honor to have you on Parks and Trails. And I've learned so much just in this presentation and, and having you be the voice of all the tiny, what were before invisible creatures and having um, really having that voice, I think is so important to our overall biodiversity and just the um, immense amount of experience it colors my life with now. Um, and I um, just want to ask everybody if you have questions, uh, you can put them in the chat box. I see Bob's hand is up. Um, we'll just run through a, a conversation here and I'll be watching the chat box. Okay. I have a Bob, question. I have a question. I'm allergic to hornets. 
and uh, not necessarily bees. I almost uh, had a real serious attack 20 years ago. Had to go to the hospital. Was my, I was losing my pre, uh, body, body functions. Mm. Uh, what's the difference? Uh, why am I allergic to hornets and not bees? You know, venom has evolved in lots of different ways. And, um, you know, depending on the lineage of the species, like some bees, there's, there's still, the truth is with 20,000 species of bee in the world, um, we're still learning a lot about them. But basically there are varying degrees of chemical compounds. The, the really super social species like some of the wasp and some of the honeybees, the venom is much more toxic because they have this prize of this comb that they're trying to protect. So I suspect there are a lot of solitary wasps as well. Same deal with them is that they don't really want to sting you. In fact, some of the smallest insects in the world are, are um, these angel wasps that you can't even see with the naked eye. Um, most of those, if they're not too small to sting, they're just not social. So the ones that are the most venomous are the really high, highly social, like yellow jackets, for example. So I suspect it's probably something to do with that. So it was a hornet a bee or re 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 related to a bee? A hornet is a wasp. And so actually, um, believe it or not, we actually don't have many true hornets. They're actually wasps. There's a European hornet that is in the Eastern United States. And then there's a cicada killer and some other things. But most are actually just they, common names, you know, vary. But most of them are actually just different types of wasps, which wasp and hornets are closely related, but they're in a different, different group. Thank you. Sure. Um, Mila, um, I don't know. Well, Susie, did you have a, did you have a question, or you just had a comment? No, just a just a comment. Um, just a, a couple comments here, Clay. Just thanking you so much um, for the information. Very informative. Um, Mila, um, did you want to unmute and ask your question, or else I can for you? Sure, I've unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, Okay, every spring before I've opened my windows and doors, I find bumblebees in my house. Unless I can catch them, of course, they die inside. And I'm wondering why these bees show up in the house and where they might be coming from. This is a great question and this is the right time to ask that. So thank you, Mila. Um, so what those, what's happening is these are new queens. And once they emerge from this mouse burrow that they've, or this burrow that they've overwintered in, they're looking for a place to start their nest. And so many times, for example, I'll often find them in my garage because my garage is really old and there are holes. And so the bees are looking for places to nest. So it's really common for them to fly. I don't know, maybe in your case, if they're coming you know, under, from underneath the house or maybe they're flying in the window or the door, but either way, basically those are just new queens who are ready to start a family. And um, so they will often fly into places that look cool and dark. Um, and they just end up in our houses. And so I have the same issue. And so it, really easy to catch a bee, just for those of you who don't know how to do it, just take a, a glass jar um, and trap the insect and then slide a little piece of card underneath and you can just take it outside and release it. And those bees are afraid, they're trying to get away. So, um, you know, I don't wanna lead anybody down the wrong path if you're allergic to bees, but in general, they're not gonna try to try to get you. So Mila, thank you so much for that question and for trying to, to release those bees. It's, it's really kind of you. Thank you. Thanks, Mila. Um, Jen Magic uh, just had a comment and I can agree the, this photographic journey that you've taken on us on is uh, extremely inspiring. Um, so it really is, uh, it's going to be a nice piece and a nice recording um, to put on our website for people to view. Thank you. Um, yeah. So thanks for that comment, Jen. Michelle, do you want to unmute and ask your question about spraying and mosquitoes? I'm not sure my headphones are working. I can hear you. You got it. Oh, okay, good. Uh, yeah, no, I, I am curious. I live kind of close to the river and I know there is a mosquito spray uh, truck that comes through at certain times of the year. Um, our neighbors, uh, 10 year old has bees that he, um, you know, raises for honey. And we've put up signs along our, uh, in our front of our home saying, please don't spray. Um, but yeah, I'm just really curious if you know anything, Clay, about what the city of Livingston 
sprays for mosquitoes when they do it, uh, what, you know, and, and what our opportunities are to request that they don't do that on our homes or just, uh, I, I feel like there's, a, I, I still have a lot to learn about the spraying and uh, how it impacts pollinators. And um, yeah, so I'm curious if you know more about that. Um, I, I think this is a great question and one that uh, to, to be honest, concerns me because, you know, one of the one of the things that's often touted is that that these sprayings take place when um, bees are not active. But that's a very um, honeybee centric way of looking at spraying, because many bees uh, actually don't sleep in the nest. Many bees sleep on the flowers, um, especially our native bees, and so it's not uncommon, especially later in the season when some of these springs may take place to find Western bumblebees and other species of bees resting all over the vegetation, along with a lot of other kinds of insects. And so, um, you know, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a problem. And I think one of the things that I, I'm digging into this issue more, but I think one of the things we need to look at is like, you know, spraying, spraying happens because especially in certain parts of the world, I'm from the South, East. So I, I know about mosquitoes. In certain parts of the world, mosquitoes can cause a lot of illness. Places like Montana, you know, as far as I know, there hasn't been a case of West Nile in, in Park County. Um, certainly not common. And so, you know, I would love to look at, you know, are there other ways to mitigate mosquito issues? For example, making sure that our community doesn't have standing water and old tires, things like that. That's a much more efficient way to get rid of mosquitoes in your community than just spraying the entire town with chemicals because quite frankly, you know, um, the more work and research I do into pesticides, the more I realize that, that not only does it impact lots of different what are called non-target insects, the birds that eat those insects, that is compounded, for example, in the bodies of those birds. Um, the spraying takes, I, I was looking at the routes where the spraying takes place it's along the river. So some of these things harm fish. Um, or they harm insects that the fish eat. And we all know that trout fishing is a big part of, of our, our city, our tourism. Um, it's something that we're proud of as a community, but inadvertently, and we're, we're trying to stop one thing, but we're actually causing harm in other ways. And so I guess the question I ask is, does the harm, the good outweigh the harm that's being caused? Um, so I think what, if, if, if we want to try to, um, stop this from happening, I think we have, as a community, need to raise our voices and say, you know, we understand the risks of X, Y, and Z, but we're more concerned about the impacts of this on our pollinators, on our birds, on our fish, and quite frankly, on, on ourselves and our children, um, and, and sort of raise our voices on that. Because I think that there's often a lot of lines that are used that say, well, this is not harmful, but I think the research typically shows that oftentimes these things are harmful, especially when they're compounded over time. Thank you. I just um, want, yeah. Oh. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, I just want to add just a little bit to that. Um, in parks and trails predating clay or knowing of clay, we investigated just some of the mosquito spraying program and it's actually not a city program, it's a county program. And, but as you know, we're very integrated and entwined with the county and the city. Um, so the county program spraying county areas, which includes school districts, which are intermingled within our neighborhoods and as well as yeah, down by the rivers. And uh, we investigated a little bit and it's, it's just, um, they can't provide a spraying schedule and it is based on inclement weather and there's a lot of hurdles around that but um, we're interested in in finding out more of those details and maybe how we can navigate other options for spraying as clay was mentioning um, so trying to reduce pesticide use um, across the whole gambit in the city as well as the county I, and I, I have called and um, we put up, we can hear the spray, it comes right by our house, we can hear it come in. Uh, it's usually the, like dusk or around bedtime. Can, uh, and, and we put up 
I've been told that when we put up signs out in front of our house that they won't spray and several of our neighbors had. So that's maybe another option too, as a, a organizing the folks that are interested. Uh, we needed, we, the kids kind of spray painted their own signs and put them out on the street there. And they're a little, I mean, they're cute, but I, I think maybe if we got more organized and, and bought, had some signs available for folks that wanted to put them up, maybe that would be um, one initial first step. Yeah, I love that idea. I, I think the thing concerns me with spraying, if you're spraying, if they spray up to your neighbor's house and then they, they skip your house, you're still gonna get drift. Drift is a big problem. And so, yeah, I think that raising our voice as a community is a really good place to start and something that I would love to talk with the Parks and Trails Committee about and um, the Environmental Council too. Great. Standing by, we're ready for those conversations and really grateful, Clay, for your uh, expertise um, in helping us understand uh, the, the consequences of those choices that we make in our community. So thank you. Sure. Susie, did you want to unmute and, and talk about that program a little bit that you mentioned? You don't have to either. I just want to give people the opportunity to have a voice. Yeah, we'd love to hear it. Sure. Um, I just learned about this program and just came home recently with a bag of seed. I live over in Bozeman. Um, the Gallatin County Conservation District, it has started, I think just last fall, a program offering free native uh, pollinator wildflower seed mixes to people, anything in, in bags from 500 square feet, I think up to like 3000 square feet or something, uh, a lot more than, than we can put in our yard and encouraging people to convert uh, lawn into pollinator wildflower gardens. They've got two different seed mixes. One is all native and another is uh, mostly native, but it has some other, species in it that help uh, outcompete uh, weeds if you're just trying to get you know get a, a weedy lot converted to pollinators and it's the the program in Gallatin County it's through the Gallatin Conservation District and I think I want to say Lake County Montana was the first to start the program and vote and Gallatin County adopted it um, but it it looks pretty wonderful um, Gallatin Conservation District, the website is gallatincd.org, and a woman named Sarah, I don't have her last name, is the one who's coordinating it here. Uh, and I think, I think they, Gallatin County basically took the template from, I think it was Lake County, but it sure looks like something that PCEC would be interested in. That's really cool, Susie. I had no idea. Thanks for pointing that yeah. out. Yeah, I was pretty psyched to hear about it. Thank you, Susie. Um, Bob, did you have another question about when's the best time to create those bee habitats in our gardens in the fall? Yes, I was just curious. My stalks are, my new stuff's coming out, but I have the old stalks. Should I leave them up for another month or should I cut them and put them somewhere else? Like your picture, you would bundled them into a tree. What's the best way now to deal with those stalks? That's a really good question. Um, and I, my advice may not give you the best raspberry yield. Um, I can't say whether or not that's the case, but I think if you can wait until I think the days are consistently in the 60s, you know, um, probably for another week or so or something like that, you could probably cut them out and bundle them over. The best thing, the best thing is just don't cut them before winter because those bees are in there overwintering. So even if you cut them um, and then bundle them up or put them in a, you know, on the side of a compost bin or something like that, the bees can at least escape and then they'll start over again. Thanks for asking that. That's a good question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, I have lost my chat box for some reason, so I can't. I, see I can it see anymore. it, Sarah. Um, so Thank Jen, you. Jen just pointed out that Bozeman has a two hundred dollar rebate per household for purchase of drought tolerant plants to encourage people to plant natives, which is super. I would love to see that here in 
here in Livingston. Hey, the other thing I'd love to add, Sarah, is that we do we have some members uh, that I can think of off the top of my head in Paradise Valley, uh, Pete Murray, um, and then there's Dorothy and Leo, but Pete Murray has a bug garden. Um, Dorothy and Leo plant, they've got this beautiful monarch butterfly garden that they open up for. And I, I wonder, um, you know, we maybe could, uh, Pete Murray actually had emailed me a while ago and suggested we try, we create a little group of folks that are interested in um, uh, building their landscaping their homes to be more pollinator friendly. Um, so I, I don't know if folks are interested in that, but that's certainly something that we could help facilitate. Um, I think that I, I, I'm certain that Pete would be excited to give a tour of his bug garden, maybe virtually and Leo and Dorothy always have kind of an open door policy for their uh, monarch butterfly gardens that they have down there. And I've taken the kids and it's super cool. Um, so if, if folks are interested, I encourage you to, to let us know and then maybe we can create a little um, community around this and introduce Clay you to some of these folks that are already doing this um, in their backyards. I would love that. And I sort of have a couple of fantasies for Livingston. One is the idea of creating pollen or pollinator uh, corridors, which can be done through people planting, um, you know, pollinator friendly gardens, and that gives these insects a place to move through and birds as well and lots of other species. So um, being able to map that out and creating a pollinator friendly network corridor would be maybe a cool way to get other people in the community to get involved. For example, if two neighbors on either side of a house are, are you know, doing this and the one in the middle is not doing it, that would be uh, kind of a cool way to encourage and create a little friendly competition. The other thing is that I would love to look into getting um, Bee City USA designation for Livingston. Currently, Red Lodge is the first um, city that's done this, but we, you know, we could close, we could certainly do this as well. And uh, I think it'd be a really great way to bring attention to Livingston's pollinators and the work that we're doing here in the community. Thanks, Clay. I'm so happy you mentioned Bee City and kind of the next steps and to making it more formal. Um, I don't have any other questions in the chat box. We have one minute and 15 seconds left. If anybody has anything else that they want to add um, or just comments. Otherwise, I love the ideas that we've all thrown around. Clay, why don't you go ahead and wrap this up? Well, I just want to say thanks to everyone for being here. Um, your questions were great, and it, it's really um, heartwarming, to be honest, to have people in the community who are interested in this. And I'm super excited. I mean, I, I really feel like we have so much opportunity here to do to make a real difference for for our pollinators. And uh, looking forward to meeting you all in person one of these days soon, and going out and looking for some for some bees. Thanks, Clay. Thanks everybody for showing up today and participating. Um, very excited of initiatives that are happening and enjoy your time not mowing this month. That's right. Take care, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>